In 1945, tragedy struck. A B-25 bomber with two pilots and one passenger aboard was flying from New Bedford, Massachusetts to LaGuardia Airport in New York City. As it neared the metropolitan area on that fateful Saturday morning, the fog became particularly thick. Air traffic control rerouted them to Newark, and the flight plan took the plane over Manhattan. The plane was flying low, too low, and the pilots saw the Chrysler building ahead of them. The pilots swerved to avoid the massive skyscraper, barely missing it, but, in avoiding it, went straight into the north side of the Empire State Building, near the 79th floor. Upon impact, the plane's fuel exploded, ripping a hole in the side of the building. There were 14 victims in all. But despite the impact, the explosion, and the fact that one of the plane's engines had gone all the way through the building, the structural integrity held. The building did not fall. And those above were able to evacuate safely. The Empire State Building was a masterpiece of architecture and engineering, yet it was able to be completed in just 15 months and only cost $24.7 million. The circumstances surrounding its price tag and the incredible efficiency that allowed it to be built three months ahead of schedule comes down to the innovation of the technique of fast-track construction and the strict planning of its creators. The building derives its name from a nickname given to the state of New York. One of the oldest documented sources for the nickname being a letter written by George Washington in 1785, in which he expresses an admiration for New York's strength during the American Revolution and deems the state the seat of the empire. Not only was the 1,453-foot, 103-story structure built in just over 13 months, the construction company that took on the daunting job allegedly began with nothing on hand, no equipment or supplies that would be sufficient for such an enormous undertaking. It's rumored that General Motors executive John J. Raskob conceived of the project when he decided to best his arch-rival, Walter Chrysler, who had begun construction on the 1,046-foot Chrysler building. The Chrysler building was already in competition with the Bank of Manhattan building at 40 Wall Street to be the tallest building in the world. Raskob rounded up a group of well-known investors that included Coleman and Pierre S. Dupont, Louis G. Kaufman, and Ellis P. Earl to form Empire State Incorporated. He appointed former governor of New York and presidential candidate Alfred E. Smith to head the group. Raskob then went to the architectural firm Shreve, Lamb, and Harmon Associates who were known as the best skyscraper architects in the city. He told them that he not only wanted an office building whose height would exceed that of the Chrysler building, but he wanted it to be finished first. It is said that Raskob pulled a thick pencil out of a drawer and handed it to one of the architects he had hired, William Lamb, and asked, Bill, how high can you make it without it falling down? They had theorized that they could beat the Chrysler building's design at 80 stories, but Raskob was worried that Walter Chrysler would pull a trick like hiding a rod in the spire and then sticking it up at the last minute, so they made it even taller. The Empire State Building's architects also wanted to make this building something that would stand out. One way they did this was by creating a building with four facades facing the street, rather than just one that most buildings had. The highlight of the building would be its imperious tower, set off by the building of the lower levels and indented setbacks of the center. Steel columns and beams were used to form a stable 3D grid, because the column grids were to be closely spaced, the open spaces in the building would be obstructed. As a result, there would be no column-free spaces on any of the building's floors. The schedule on this project was as adventurous as the design was. The project would be done, the architects planned, in only 18 months. The general contractors, Start Brothers and Eakin, who were known as the premier skyline builders of the 1920s, made a bold bid to win the job. Not only did they promise that they could get the job done on time, but they announced that they would purchase custom-fitted equipment to fulfill the contract. The Star Brothers were sure that the other commercial contractors trying to get the job had assured the client that they had plenty of equipment, and what they didn't have, they would rent. The Star Brothers decided to use a different tactic. During the interview process, when asked how much equipment the construction company had on hand, they answered that they didn't own anything that would be useful on this project. They explained to the investors that the size and scope of the Empire State Building would create unusual problems. Ordinary building equipment would not suffice, so they would have to design and purchase all new custom pieces. They would sell that equipment and credit the investors with the difference when the project was complete. 
Their opinion was that this would cost less than renting secondhand equipment and would be much more efficient. With such an extremely tight schedule, Star Brothers and Eakin had to start planning immediately. They determined that more than 60 different types of tradespeople would be required and that most supplies would need to be ordered to specification because of the immense job scope. The supplies had to be made at the plants in as close to finished state as possible to minimize preparatory work needed at the site. The companies they hired had to be dependable, able to provide quality work, and willing to adhere to the allotted timetable. Time had to be scheduled nearly to the minute. The schedule dictated that each section of the building process overlapped. Not a moment was to be wasted. The Empire State Building was the first commercial construction project to employ the technique of fast-track construction, a commonplace approach today, but a very new idea in the early 20th century. This technique consists of starting the construction process before the designs are fully completed in order to reduce delays in inflation costs. In this case, it was imperative to use the fast-track construction method to win the race for the tallest building. In order to make this work, the structural engineer made a schematic design based on the architect's sketches. The schematic design includes the materials to be used in the construction, either reinforced concrete or steel, types of floors, and column spacing. The contractors began excavation for the new building in January of 1930, even before the demolition of the site's previous occupant, the original Waldorf Astoria Hotel, had been completed. As a side note, many people at the time were actually huge fans of the Waldorf Astoria Hotel. Thousands of people asked for mementos from the building when it was announced that they were tearing it down. Many of these people did receive these mementos, including a couple getting a key from the room they had occupied on their honeymoon. Parts of the hotel not given away were torn down piece by piece and sold, or sadly, hauled to a dock loaded onto barges and then taken 15 miles out into the ocean before it being dumped. Anyway, the Star Brothers had pioneered the simultaneous work of demolition and foundation lane just a year earlier when building 40 Wall Street, an earlier competitor in the race to erect the world's tallest building. Two shifts of 300 men worked day and night, digging through hard rock and creating the foundation. Less than two months later, in March of 1930, construction began on the steel skeleton. The frame of the skyscraper rose at a rate of four and a half stories per week, or more than a story per day. No comparable building has been built at a similar rate of speed. This accomplishment came about through effective logistics combined with a skilled, organized workforce. The project then became a model of efficiency. The contractors created various innovations that saved time, money, and manpower. The 60,000 tons of steel for the framework were manufactured in Pittsburgh and transported immediately to New York via train, barge, and truck. Legend has it that the steel posts and beams arrived at the site marked with their place in the framework and with the number of the derrick that would hoist them. Workers could then swing the girders into place and have them riveted as quickly as 80 hours after coming out of the furnace and off the roller. A railway was built at the construction site to move materials quickly. Since each railway car, a cart pushed by people, held eight times more than a wheelbarrow, the materials were also moved with less effort. The steel girders could not be raised more than 30 stories at a time, so several large derricks were used to pass the girders up to higher floors. In those days, bricks used for construction were usually dumped in the street and then moved from the pile to the bricklayer by wheelbarrow as needed. The streets would have to be closed off, and the labor moving the bricks was backbreaking and inefficient. With 10 million bricks needed for this job, the old method would be impractical and a waste of time. Instead, the Stard Brothers and Eakin devised a chute that led to a hopper in the basement. As the bricks arrived by truck, the contractors had had them dumped into the chute. When they were needed, the bricks were released from the hopper and dropped into carts, which were then hoisted up to the appropriate floor. At the same time the outside of the building was being constructed, electricians and plumbers began installing the internal necessities of the building. Timing for each trade to start working was finely tuned, and the building rose as if being constructed on an assembly line one where the assembly line did the moving and the finished product stayed put. In addition to the steel frame, construction materials included 62,000 cubic yards of concrete, 200,000 cubic feet of Indiana limestone and granite, which comprised most of the exterior, 10,000 square feet of Rose Famosa and Australiante marble, 6,500 windows whose spandrels were sandblasted to blend their color into the tone of the windows, 
and 300,000 square feet of Hauntville and Rokeron marble for the elevator lobbies and the corridors on the office floors. The Starrett brothers managed a workforce of 3,500 men who put in 7 million man-hours, including work on Sundays and holidays. The workers earned $15 a day, an excellent rate of pay in the early 1930s. The project was completed ahead of schedule and under budget. Instead of taking 18 months as anticipated, the construction took just under 15. Due to the reduced cost during the Depression, the final cost totaled only $24.7 million instead of the estimated $43 million. In September of 1930, only partially finished, the Empire State Building officially became the world's tallest skyscraper. The 1,046-foot Chrysler Building, which was completed in May of 1930, had held the title for only a few months. When the 85th floor of the Empire State Building was completed, it officially eclipsed its rival. Construction was completed on April 11, 1931, one year and 45 days after it had begun. President Herbert Hoover officially opened the building on May 1, 1931, by pressing a button in Washington, D.C., which turned on the building's lights. The Empire State Building remained the world's tallest skyscraper for more than 40 years until the World Trade Center towers were constructed in 1972. Although it is no longer the tallest building in the world, the Empire State Building is a crowning achievement of architecture, a symbol of New York City, and most of all, an amazing accomplishment in the field of commercial construction. 73 elevators wait to take visitors to the upper floors, but if you prefer the stairs, you'll have to climb 1,860 steps. 70 million people have viewed the world from the platforms on the 86th and 102nd floors, approximately 35,000 people a day. The building has appeared in over 50 different movies. Floodlights in 18 different color combinations shine on the top of the building on special occasions and holidays. The building also serves as a lightning rod for the city, getting struck approximately 100 times a year. The Starrett brothers in Eakin had also served as general contractors on other skyscrapers, constructing numerous other office towers, hospitals, and banks throughout the United States and Europe, mostly in the first four decades of the 20th century. Today, the company is named the Starrett Corporation. They serve as a comprehensive real estate firm, providing services from initial project planning through the development, financing, telecom, technology and energy integration, construction, sale, and management of real estate projects. The short timetable allotted in creating a building taller than the Eiffel Tower has led to an extraordinary level of planning and innovating that helped make one of the most iconic buildings in the United States, if not the world. Thank you for watching Learn Something New. If you liked this video and would like to see more similar to it, leave a like and subscribe to the channel. See you next time!